This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. The Trump administration is under fire for delaying plans to replace Andrew Jackson's portrait on the $20 bill with abolitionist leader Harriet Tubman. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin made the announcement last week, saying Tubman won't appear on the bill until at least 2026. Under a 2016 Obama initiative, Tubman was originally scheduled to replace Andrew Jackson by 2020, the 100th anniversary of women being granted the right to vote. She'll be the first woman in over a century and the first African-American to appear on the front of a U.S. bank note. President Trump cited President Andrew Jackson as his favorite president. This is Trump speaking on NBC in 2016. I think Harriet Tubman is fantastic. I would love to I would love to leave Andrew Jackson and see if we can maybe come up with another denomination. Maybe we do the two dollar bill or we do another bill. I don't like seeing it. Yes, I think it's pure political correctness. Been on the bill for many, many years and you know, really represented somebody that really was very important to this country. I would love to see another denomination and that could take place. I think I think it would be more appropriate. Andrew Jackson was a slaveholder who, in 1830, signed the Indian Removal Act, which forced 16,000 Native Americans from their lands in what became known as the Trail of Tears. Well, for more, we continue our discussion, part two of our conversation, with Kate Clifford Larson, the author of Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero. She's a consultant for the Harriet Tubman Special Resource Study of the National Park Service. In part one, you described who uh, Harriet Tubman was. Um, now I want to ask you about President Trump's suggestion. Why not put her on a $2 bill? Uh, Kate Clifford Larson, when was the last time you saw a $2 bill? Um, I would say maybe 20 years ago, probably longer than that. Um, and I think it's incredibly insulting that he suggests that Harriet Tubman be put on a $2 bill. I think um, uh, it just shows his disregard for a true American patriot, a veteran, um, a woman who fought for civil rights and freedom and, um, and you know, just decided that Andrew Jackson was his man and he belonged on the $20 bill. He's wrong. He is very wrong. And Andrew Jackson no longer represents values that Americans say that they celebrate and um, fight for. So, you, in 2017, you visited um, the Bureau of Engraving to see what this uh, banknote, what this $20 bill would look like. Can you describe the process, first of all, where Harriet Tubman was chosen to replace Andrew Jackson? Just tell us that whole history. Um, it began earlier in the uh, 2000 teens. A young girl um, had sent a letter to President Obama and asked him why there wasn't a woman on our currency. And of course, a lot of people had been wondering that, but this young girl just encapsulated that concern. And he rose to the occasion and said, well, we're looking into it. And Secretary Liu made the final decision that the $5, $10, and $20 bill would all be redone designed to incorporate women. In the meantime, a group of, of uh, activist women started a campaign, Woman on the 20, and um, people around the country, um, hundreds of thousands, if not over a million people voted and overwhelmingly decided that Harriet Tubman belonged on the $20 bill. And um, so uh, Secretary Liu made that announcement in April of 2016. We were all thrilled. Um, and the other uh, banknotes were going to have women incorporated onto the backs of those notes. And um, so in 2017, I was invited with a group of other people to go to the Bureau of Engraving and meet the artists and designers that were creating the new note. And it was an incredible, incredible experience to see what they had done. Can you talk about Harriet Tubman and um how she ultimately freed herself and then freed so many other people? 
Um, Harriet Tubman was about 27 years old in 1849, and her enslaver had died and left his family deeply in debt. And in order to pay those debts, they were going to sell Tubman and her family. Um, so she decided she would take her chances by running away and taking her own liberty, which she did do uh, with the help of black and white um, Underground Railroad operators, and she made her way to Philadelphia. But when she arrived there, she was nominally free, but um, freedom was not very... Uh, um, what she expected it to be because everyone she loved was back in Maryland and they were enslaved. So she determined then she would go back and rescue them. And for over 10 years, she returned 13 times to bring away all of her family members and people that she loved. And um, so then when the Civil War started, her mission was to make sure that all people were uh, liberated, and she brought her battle um, against slavery um, to the South with the United States Army and became a spy and a scout. And she was a remarkably successful um, scout and uh, greatly admired by Civil War uh, Union generals and officers and uh, soldiers alike. Well, Kate, can you talk about the raid at Combe Ferry that Harriet Tubman guided, freeing some 700 enslaved people? The famous black feminist organization, the Combe River Collective, named itself after this raid. Last year, Democracy right. Now! spoke with Kianga Yamata-Taylor, assistant professor of African-American studies at Princeton University. She's the editor of a new collection of essays titled, quote, How We Get Free Black Feminism and the Combe River Collective. This is uh, Kianga. The Combahee uh, Collective named themselves after a raid that was led um, and conducted by Harriet Tubman uh, in 1853 in South Carolina, along the Combahee River, uh, that freed several hundred slaves. Um, and that really was—they wanted to— um, named themselves after uh, a political act, which I think is very important to their politics, which is um, identifying uh, clearly the ways that black women are oppressed. And I think that that is a uh, important contribution that the Combahee River uh, Collective makes, the, the discussion about interlocking oppressions, how uh, the, the way that black women uh, experience oppression in our society cannot just be factored through the lens of race, it cannot just be factored through uh, the lens of sexism or gender oppression, um, but we look at how those factors together create um, even new uh, ways of understanding um, oppression. Um, and so they <clears throat> talked about interlocking oppressions. So that's Kianga Yamata-Taylor, assistant professor of African-American studies at Princeton University. She's written a book on the Combahee Collective. Can you uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, what she said, respond to what she said, and also the fact that some have criticized the idea that Harriet Tubman should represent U.S. currency at all? In a 2015 essay, writer Feminista Jones wrote, quote, if having Harriet Tubman's face on the $20 bill was going to improve women's access to said bill, I'd be all for it. But instead, it only promises to distort Tubman's legacy, which is rooted in resisting the foundation of American capitalism. So that's uh, uh, Feminista Jones. So could you, could you respond to, to both these comments, Kate? Um, so the, the first, the professor's comments about Tubman and the oppression that she experienced um, was very real. And the incredible thing about Tubman is that she was uh, brilliant. She was a genius. Even though she could not read or write, she was brilli a brilliant strategist. Um, there was some level of, of um, courage and lack of fear that she had that just pushed her forward. She had entree into any union officer's um, 
uh, ear. She could meet with any of them. She was welcome. They listened to her. They admired her. Um, that was a remarkable moment in time during the Civil War. Uh, she even was able to testify in a military trial against a white soldier. And of course, after the Civil War, um, the rights of, of African Americans were greatly diminished. But she w lived in this moment of time where she experienced tremendous respect because of who she was, this incredibly capable black woman. Um, so I, I, it's just it's thrilling to hear them talk about naming the organization after the raid that she conducted. Um, she had a, Harriet Tubman had eight male scouts working for her, and um, it was through their work and her work that she went to the Union um, Army and said, we can do this plan, sail up the Combe River and blow up bridges and liberate people and get rid of, um, you know, some of the rebel outposts that were posing problems for the Union Army trying to get into the interior in South Carolina. So she was an amazing soldier and brilliant. Um, and the second comment about um, not wanting Tubman on the $20 bill is quite remarkable to me. And the explanation for not wanting her on the $20 bill is because this particular person felt that Tubman fought against American capitalism. And in fact, um, while Tubman fought against enslavement and slavery, she herself was an entrepreneur. She was a businesswoman. And I think that she would be immensely pleased to be on the $20 bill. And I think of um, men and women and children around this country, around the world, actually, because the $20 bill is the most um, used currency around the world, um, to have them look at this image of a freedom fighter, a woman of color, a woman of courage, of brilliance and genius who came from nowhere, who came from the most obscure and oppressed uh, circumstances to rise above, take her freedom and her liberty, bring it to other people, and continue to persist and persevere. So I just don't understand that feeling that she doesn't belong on the $20 bill when uh, she herself was a, an entrepreneur and a businesswoman and um, wanted people to have um, uh, um, self-determination to be able to make a way in the world. And um, I think having her on the $20 bill would go a long way to inspiring people to do that. Um, Kate, uh, talk about how you came to write the biography of Harriet Tubman. Talk about your own history. Um, back in 1993, I was working for a small regional investment bank, and I had my MBA, and I decided that that just was not inspiring me anymore, and I'd always had a passion for history, and I decided to go back and get my master's in women's history. At the same time, my daughter was uh, seven years old and in um, uh, second grade, and she came home with a little biography of Harriet Tubman. And while I was vaguely aware of Tubman at the time, reading the little children's book inspired me to look for an adult biography. And the last one that had been published at that time was in the 1940s. And I was stunned. And so were my professors at Simmons. And that set me on a journey to continue um, my studies and get my PhD. Um, and my dissertation was a, the biography of Harriet Tubman. And it turned out that there was so much information to be had about her because she w met so many different abolitionists who were overwhelmed by her personality, her presence, her courage, the things that she had done, and they wrote about her. And every single day, she inspired me to keep uh, moving forward with that biography. Um, and ever since then, I've continued to research her life since uh, my book came out in the early 2000s, and I've consulted for the National Park Service. We now have two parks dedicated to Harriet Tubman, one in Maryland and one in Auburn, New York, where she spent the last 50 years in freedom. And um, there are so many things happening about Tubman now, and I feel so fortunate and grateful to be part of bringing her story to the public. Can you talk about the comparison of Harriet Tubman's life, her enslavement, how she became free, fought to ensure others were freed, and the life of Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist? Well, it's an interesting comparison. Um, Frederick Douglass was born on the eastern shore of Maryland as well. Um, 
1818, about four years before Tubman was born. Um, he was uh, enslaved like Tubman. Um, he was mistreated like she was. Um, and he had advantages of being able to, to spending time in Baltimore. He learned to read and write. Um, and then he took his freedom with the help of his uh, freeborn uh, wife, who was also born on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, Frederick Douglass um, was an orator and a statesman. He did not do the work that Tubman did, going back into basically enemy territory and fighting the battle of slavery on the ground there by rescuing people and bringing them north, frustrating those slaveholders by um, robbing them basically of their, their property. Um, but Frederick Douglass was on the stage and Harriet Tubman was uh, under the, the cover of nighttime. Um, going back and rescuing people. And in fact, uh, one, day, one time Frederick Douglass wrote about Tubman. He said that while his work was in the limelight, hers was under the midnight stars. Well, Kate, can you talk about what most surprised you as you were writing this biography and what are the biggest misperceptions about Harriet Tubman? Um, well, first of all, uh, I was surprised at her humor. She had great humor, and um, people who met her wrote about that. It was a very dry sense of humor. And she also was uh, brilliant. She remembered everything that she heard and saw. She could recite passages from the Bible. Um, she was really a genius, and unfortunately, genius back in those days was recognized only through letters, people who could write and read letters. Um, but she had this amazing skill to be able to read a landscape, to read the night sky, to read people, um, to hear and listen and, and sense danger. Um, she was also an incredibly spiritual person. She had deep and profound faith in God. And she believed that God protected her on all of these missions. And um, I don't know if anyone can argue with her about that, because certainly she risked her life every single day. And um, she was never caught. And she was inc incredibly successful. Um, so these are those are just some of the things that surprised me. Um, she just, uh, her presence, um, sparked awe in people. She was only five feet tall, <laughs> but people who met her were overwhelmed by her personality. John Brown, the famous John Brown, who struck really the first blow of the Civil War on his attack at Harper's Ferry, when he met Harriet Tubman, he was overwhelmed by her and he called her General Tubman, which is remarkable at that time period for a white man to call a small, petite black woman a general. And did, so that just gave me a sense of the strength of her personality and her character. And she was an incredible leader because le people followed her. And sometimes they weren't even sure why, particularly on the Underground Railroad, but she inspired confidence and her leadership style was um, profound and very successful. And Kate Clifford Larson, did Harriet Tubman know Sojourner Truth? Um, they did not really know each other. They met each other once, um, and Tubman mentioned that she regretted— uh, Sojourner Druth had told her that she had met Abraham Lincoln, and Tubman had not met Lincoln, and apparently she had an opportunity and she did not. Um, and she regretted that because she determined that he ultimately was a very good man uh, who helped end the Civil War and liberate um, enslaved people. Mm. Uh, finally, artist uh, Dana Wall has created a stamp that can be used to superimpose Harriet Tubman's image over President Andrew Jackson's on the $20 bill. This is Wall speaking to MSNBC, explaining why he decided to make the stamp. This country has a long issue with representation and equity. Mm -hmm. um, in general, I think uh, we live in a racist society and currency. Um, by virtue of its ubiquity, has the power to uh, spread ideas about who we are as a nation mm -hmm. and what we represent. Um, and so I felt it was a really monumentally symbolic, important change um, to include Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill mm -hmm. um, and was really enraged and heartbroken when it sounded like that was going to be taken away. So that was artist Dana Wall. You, too, have a stamp. Is that right, Kate? 
I do. I had it made about a year and a half ago, just an online company that makes stamps. And um, I sent them a little headshot of Tubman, and they made the stamp, and, and I stamped my $20 bills. So maybe it's going to happen by the uh, the centennial of women getting the right to vote anyway. People just Let's stamping hope. these Let's bills. Hope. <laughs> well, Kate Clifford Larson, we thank you so much for being with us, historian and um, Harriet Tubman scholar, author of Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero. And we will link to our first part of our conversation at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.